Good morning, team. We're going to start off with general chemistry, chapter 1, atomic structure. We're going to start off with 1.1, talking about subatomic particles. Now, there are three particles that make up the atom. We have proton, neutron, and electrons. So, um, we're going to start off with protons here. They're found in the nucleus. Uh, they have a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Uh, Coulombs is represented with a capital C. The mass of protons is approximately one atomic mass unit, which can be written in a short form as just a simple AMU. Uh, these positively charged ions can, are cations. So the, the way I like to remember this is that the T in the middle of the cation is actually a positive sign. And boom, there you go. Cation, positive, protons. Uh, to find the number of protons, we have the atomic number, which is Z. So I've given an example here. When you have 19K or 19 potassium, you're going to think, okay, that is 19 protons. We're going to get into some examples later to make it a bit more easier, but just a quick example of there. So in a passage, if they say, the atomic number of element X is 19. Um, you know, in your head, you're going to be, okay, that's the number of protons. You're going to look at your periodic table and you're going to say, oh, that's uh, that's potassium. Moving on, we have neutrons. Um, same location and similar mass to protons. Um, for this, we have the mass number A. A is the number of protons and neutrons um, in that specific element. So if we look at the on the side here, we have X, which could be just any element. You have a superscript of A and a subscript of Z. That's usually how it's written. So the superscript A is uh, the mass number, and the subscript Z is the number of protons, also known as the atomic number. Another way this could be written is X, so any element, dash A, and A is the mass number. So there are just wor um, various forms to write this, but make sure you're comfortable with each of them. And then for neutrons, the term isotope comes up a lot. And that just means same, num uh, same atomic number, which is Z, but different mass number, A. Um, that pretty much sums it down to it can be the same element but with different neutrons. So we have, uh, for example, carbon. We have a carbon-12, we have a carbon-13, carbon-14, etc. And so forth. So it's just the same element but with a different number of neutrons in that element. And then to electrons. The mass of the electrons is significantly smaller than that of a proton, so we don't usually include it in calculations. Certainly won't be on the MCAT um, or given much significance on the MCAT. But just know that electrons are a lot smaller. Um, they're not found in the nucleus. They are circling or orbiting the nucleus, which consists of both neutrons and protons. So. The, one, the electrons found closest to the nucleus are in low energy levels of shells, and most of them interact with the nucleus, whereas the ones that are further away from the nucleus are in a higher energy level, and they interact with their surroundings, which makes sense. I'm just going to draw it out for you here. Um, this is our nucleus here in the center, and then we're going to have one orbital, two orbital, three orbital. So the one found on the outside here is most likely going to interact with whatever is out here in its surroundings rather than the nucleus because of the greater distance. Whereas the one that's uh, low energy level, it's closest to the nucleus, is most likely going to interact with that nucleus rather than the surrounding which is all the way here. Does that make sense? Oh, also, um, the electrons that are further away from the nucleus... Um, may be written as valence electrons, 
So when we get into organic chemistry, or even later in this, uh, in this uh, chapter, we're going to come across the term valence electrons a lot. And just keep in mind, that's the number of electrons um, that are furthest away from the nucleus. Electrons, unlike protons, are negatively charged. So they're going to be uh, written as anions, just to keep that in mind. And the charge is determined by the number of electrons present. So the more uh, electrons, the higher the charge. And then we're going to jump to 1.2, which is pretty much um, differentiating between atomic mass and atomic weight. For the atomic mass, it's uh, the units are atomic mass units, so AMU. The atomic mass is the sum of both protons and neutrons, and it's the same as the mass number, which is A. So the example I've given here is 12 carbon, which is uh, 12 AMU, and then a 13 carbon, which is 13 AMU. So whatever the mass number of that element, that will be your atomic mass. For atomic weight, however, it's the weight average of the naturally occurring isotopes of the element, and the units are also in AMU. So we have 30p and 31p, which is the atomic weight. And we're just going to take an average, like it says, it's a weight average. So we're going to add 30 plus 31 divided by 2, and we're going to get 30.5 amu. That would be your atomic weight. Uh, lucky for us, the period uh, periodic table lists atomic weights and not atomic masses, so it works in our favor here. So just note the atomic mass, the sum of protons and neutrons, atomic weight is the weight average. So we're going to add the two and divide by two. And uh, just a side note here that one mole uh, is equal to the atomic weight, which is equal to the Avogadro's constant um, can be shown by Na, which is 6 times 10 to the 23. So we're going to touch more on this later as we go throughout the chapter. But uh, just a little side note here for that to keep in mind. And then we're going to jump to 1.3, which is atomic structure. We're going to start off with the Rutherford model, which illustrates that electrons surround the positively charged and dense nucleus. From that came the Max Planck theory, which is the first quantum theory that says that energy is an electromagnetic radiation in discrete bundles called quanta. And this is represented by the equation below here, where E is equal to H times F. H is the Planck's constant, which is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative uh, 34 joules times second. And F is frequency, which can be represented with nu or a lowercase v. Um, another way to illustrate uh, this quantum theory is... Um, something that we'll touch on in the physics uh, chapter, which is h times c over wavelength. So again, h is the Planck's constant, and c is actually the speed of light. So, but for the chemistry part, just know that e is equal to h times f. We're going to move on to the Bohr model here, where it shows that electrons are in discrete shells around the nucleus. And once again, the nucleus is represented as being dense and positively charged. Um, and we have an equation here from, from this model, which is called the angular momentum of electrons orbiting. So that represents L. So L is equal to N times H over 2 pi. And this uh, N is the quantum number, so it's any positive integer. And H is again the Planck's constant, which is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times second. We have another equation that was derived from the Bohr model, which is energy of the electron. So you have E is equal to negative RH, which is Rydberg 
unit of energy, and that is 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules over electron over n squared, which is the energy level of an electron. So if you were to extend this equation, it will become n or the initial energy level squared minus uh, final energy level squared. And the main thing to take away is that as electrons go from lower energy level to a higher energy level, um, the energy itself increases or decreases depending on if they go up or down. And that can be illustrated with A, H, E, D. So they will go uh, to a higher energy level if they were to absorb light, photons, you know, a higher H for higher potential, E for excited, or D from distance. So the distance increases from the nucleus is when they will go to a higher energy level and uh, their orbital levels. And then you have the atomic absorption spectra. You have uh, three main ones. Um, these may look familiar from high school chemistry, where you have continuous emission and absorption. So if uh, n is greater than 1, your quantum number for n will be equal to 1, and that's a Lehmann series. If n is greater to 2, uh, n will be equal to 2 in the Balmer series, and that's associated with the visible light, which is important for us. And then n is a uh, if n is greater than three, n will be equal to three in the passions series. Um, don't need to memorize this, but just know um, how these three series work. We're gonna continue on to one point four, which is quantum mechanical model of atom. We're gonna look at the Heisenberg uncertainty principle pretty much states that it's impossible to know both the electron's position and its momentum exactly at the same time. So for that, we have four quantum numbers. We're going to start off with the principle, which is uh, usually quantum number n. It's the electron energy level or shell number. It can be any whole value starting from 1 up onwards. And then we have uh, L, which is the 3D shape of the orbital, and it's usually n minus 1. So if your n is 2, um, you're going to go 2 minus 1 is 1, so your L value be 1. And on the side here, um, if your n is 0, it's an s orbital. If it's uh, 1, it's a p. If it's 2, it's a d orbital. If it's 3, it's f. If it's 4, it's g. We're going to look, uh, we're going to touch on that a little later here. And then moving on, we have the magnetic, which is a M with a subscript of L. So it's the orbital subtype. So whatever your L value is, for example, if it's 2, it's going to be from minus 2 all the way up to positive 2. So it's going to be minus 2, minus 1, 0, positive 1, positive 2. And that's how that works. And then we have the spin, which is M subscript S, uh, and that's the electron spin. So there's only two types. You can either have a positive spin or a negative spin. Um, and the maximum electrons in term of N are 2N squared, and the maximum uh, electrons in subshell is uh, 4L plus 2. So... We're going to look at this colorful uh, periodic table down here. When we were talking about S, P, D, and F orbitals, this is what I meant. So this is a good graph to know and to uh, see how it works. So you have group 1 and 2, including helium, um, which represent the S orbital. You have your transition metal metals in the middle here in the pink uh, that represent the D orbitals. Underneath that, you have the F, and then you have your metalloids plus nonmetals, which uh, create the P orbitals. And just above here, you have the different shapes for each of the orbitals. So the S is more circular. The P, you have um, 
this balloon eight like figure. D looks like a positive sign of four leaf clover of some sort, and F is just going crazy. It's very unlikely that you will see F um, orbital shapes on the MCAT, but just know um, how they look and what to look for if it does comes up. And then you have the Pauli exclusion principle that just states that no two electrons in an atom can have the same set of four numbers. Um, and this will be shown in the examples that we do later. So we have the Oath Boo principle, which states that each subshell would completely fill before electrons enter the next one. And the Hans rule, uh, every orbital in a subshell is singly occupied with one electron before any one orbital is doubly occupied. And that will show um, with the examples we do for spin. So here are just some examples. So when n is equal to 1, we'll have 1s squared because s has a space for 2. And then when n is equal to 2, we'll have 2s2 and 2p6 because there's space for 6 electrons in the p orbital. And then when n is equal to 3, we'll have 3s2, 3p6, and 3d10. So for the d orbitals in the pink here, um, there's space for 10 electrons. So 1s2 um, will have l is equal to 0. So remember that when uh, whatever the value for l is n minus 1. So whatever n is, so if n is 1, it will be 1 minus 1, and your l value will be 0. And we know from before that if l is 0, that represents an s orbital. And uh, l e is equal to 1 represents a p orbital, l2 is a d orbital, and l3 is an f orbital. So we have an example on the top right here, which is 3p5. And um, if we were to figure out each of the quantum numbers, this is how it would be. So 3p5. Um, if we just look at 3p, we know that it's going to be um, energy level uh, n is equal to 3. So we're going to write that there. And uh, l is equal to 1. And that's because um, we're already given that it's in the p orbital. And from what we know before, um, p orbital is when the l value, l value is equal to 1. So our n is equal to 3, l is equal to 1. So ml is uh, the subtype. And for f boo principle, if we can recall that each subshell uh, will completely fill before electrons enter the next one. And because we have five electrons, we're going to go and uh, fill this up. So we got one, two, three, four, and five. So we have the five electrons there. And you might be wondering why I took just these three. That's because since... Um, because we're dealing with the p6 orbital, um, there will only be three slots where um, there will be a pair each. So for these five electrons, um, now that it's full there, for the spin, we're going to look at the last electron and it's facing down. So we can say that it's a negative half spin because that arrow, um, that last arrow is pointing down. If, however, that arrow was pointing up, we would have uh, made the spin positive. So another example down here below, 4d4, so your n value is 4, and because this is the d orbital and that's given to us, we can say that l is equal to 2. And for that, we have five slots for ML. And uh, because we have four electrons, we're going to start off with 
one direction first until they're all completely filled. So we're going to start off with uh, one, two, three, four. And because that's stopped um, in the positive one direction, we're going to say that uh, the spin here is positive one half. And coming back to the elements in the periodic table and how to represent them, um, with phosphorus, the shorthand notation would be uh, neon, which is 10 electrons, and then you write the orbitals that are left, so you'll have 3s2 and 3p3. So we come up to the 3p orbital here, so that's 1, 2, 3, and that's where your phosphorus will be. So essentially, you want to take the noble gas that's uh, closest to you, but uh, not the one that's up ahead, and you haven't reached the one that you've already reached and crossed. So um, for phosphorus, we're going to go one step back, which is neon, because we've already crossed that level. And we're going to include the neon there, the noble gas, and then we're going to write out the remaining um, orbital that are left to reach to phosphorus. So if we have P minus three, for example, so we're gonna have um, the 15 electrons in phosphorus, and because it's negative three, we're just gonna switch the signs, make it positive three. That means the addition of three extra electrons is equal to 18. Um, and the same thing occurs, we're gonna write neon, because that's the closest uh, noble gas that we've already reached, um, 3s2, and then 3p6. And this is different from the original phosphorus, which is 3p3, because uh, of the addition of the three extra electrons. And because we know that uh, the p orbital can have only six electrons, and it's 3p6, we can conclude that there are no unpaired electrons left in this. So there are two types of magnets. We're going to have paramagnetic and diamagnetic. So paramagnetic um, elements have unpaired electrons and has a magnetic field, which makes sense. You know, um, if you're not coupled up, you're going to be looking for someone um, and that will be your magnetic field. However, if you are all coupled up, um, you're just giving your electron that you're partnered with all of your energy, so there is no magnetic field. And down here, we have some example problems. We're going to start off with question one. Um, it just says 58 uh, Ni, which is nickel. And we're told to find the number of protons, number of neutrons, and the number of electrons. So with 58 nickel, uh, we are given the mass number. But because we know that it's nickel, we can find out the atomic number by looking at the periodic table. So the mass number is 58, and we know that the mass number consists of uh, protons and neutrons. And... Uh, when we look at the periodic table and obtain the atomic number, we get 28, and we know that that is just uh, the number of protons. So our final answer will have protons is equal to 28, and we obtained this from the periodic table. And the number of neutrons uh, we get from the mass number minus the atomic number, so A minus Z because A consists of both uh, protons and neutrons, we'll just subtract protons from that to get the number of neutrons. So it's 58 minus 28 is equal to 30, and that's the number of neutrons that we have. And electrons will be the same as protons, which is just 28. Another example that we have on the right here is 60 nickel, um, but this one has uh, two positive charge, which just means, um, because it's positive, remember I said how uh, whatever the sign is given, just flip it. So it's a minus two electrons from nickel. 
so once again we have a and z with the element x and uh, a was given so a is 60 once again we're told to find the protons electrons and neutrons we are given the mass number which is 60 and once again mass number is protons plus neutrons uh, we look at the periodic table and we can obtain the atomic number which is uh again 28 and we know that the atomic number is just protons so right off the bat we have th our number of protons and then for the number of neutrons we'll go 60 minus 28 which gives us 32 and like i stated before electrons are the same value as protons if they're neutral elements however this one has a positive two charge which means you're taking away two electrons. So be because number of protons is 28, we can say that the number of electrons is also 28 minus the two electrons from the charge, and that gives us a total of 26 electrons in this element. Now coming down to question two, here they gave us uh, the both atomic mass and the atomic number including um, the charge on the element. So our atomic number, which is to start off with protons, just simply the number of protons in this element would be 15, because that is what uh, the atomic number is. And then the mass number is 31, which is protons and neutrons. So to find neutrons, we go 31, minus 15 that gives us 16 so we have 13 protons 16 neutrons and for the electrons um, saying this again um, electrons are equal to the number of protons in a neutral element however if there there is a charge here which is minus 3 flip the sign becomes fra positive 3 so we have 15 positive plus 3 electrons, and that gives us 18. And there you go. That's your answer for that question. For question number 3, um, they've given us element Q. Um, it can be any element. Uh, they've given us three isotopes for this element. So they said isotope A is 40 atomic mass units, 60% of naturally occurring Q. Isotope B is 44 AMU with 25% of Q, and isotope C is 41 AMU uh, with 15% of Q. So if we add all these percentages up together, we get 100%. So there, we're asked to find the atomic weight, and in this, what we'll do is we'll convert the percentage uh, for each isotope into a decimal value, so it's 0 0.6. 0 0.25 and 0 0.15 and for each decimal value we'll multiply it by the atomic mass unit so just right here you'll have 0 0.06 times 40 amu plus 0 0.25 times 44 amu and 0 0.15 times 41 amu and uh, that should all add up to 41 Point one five AMU and that's your total atomic weight. And this brings us to the end of chapter one. Um, I'll see you guys in chapter two. Take care.